So as you make your way to your seats, I just wanted to share with you a few announcements this morning. First, I want to remind you that we are not having any Sunday school classes today or our chow time, just the two services and the nursery. Second is that tonight is our final night of Journey to Judea for the year. So please be in prayer for tonight and, and come ready to serve if you're going to participate this evening. Also, we have a baby shower that's upcoming, so you can put this on your calendar for December 16th. Since it's now December, uh, we are going to do what we do every year. If you have um, Christmas cards that you would like to deliver and you want to save some money, you can use our Seaside Express, which is going to be set up in the South Lobby. Uh, they'll fill you in on the details of how that works. But today is the first of, of three Sundays that you can drop off your cards in the Seaside Express. The final date is going to be December 17th, and everybody that attends here regularly will have a folder out there, so please check, check your folder reg regularly out there. Lastly, we're excited to announce the new adult Bible classes that are going to be offered this first quarter of 2024. So in the 9 o'clock hour, that first service time, we will offer a continuation of the Old Testament survey class um, that's going to be taught by Joshua Johansson. That's going to meet in the east half of the commons. And then I will be teaching a class called Counseling One Another in the west half of the commons. And then the deaf class will continue to meet in room number two. So that's during the first service. And then in the 1045 hour or the second service time, we're going to have uh, the ladies' class in the east half of the commons, and Pastor Brian Neal will begin a two-year journey through the book of Revelation in the west half of the commons. And then Pastor Otto Skoog's teacher training class will continue to meet in room 11 for the first quarter of 2024. So we pastors would like to encourage each of you to consider seriously being involved in one of those adult Bible classes. So contact Pastor Brian Neal if you have any questions about the classes um, coming up here. So if th at this time, would you all please stand? And let's open our worship service with these words from Psalm 100, verses 4 through 5. It says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's sing together. How long expected Jesus born to set thy people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our rest in Spring from on high up here. Come, thou promise rod of Jesse, of thy birth we long to hear. O'er the hills the angels sing news, glad tidings of a birth. Go to him, your praises bring. Christ the Lord has come to earth. Come to earth to taste our sadness. He whose glory knew no end. By his life he brings us gladness. Our Redeemer shall. Christ was 
adoration and praise for our our God Christ our Lord well I hope that singing those praises alongside others in the church gets your heart ready that your minds and your hearts are attentive to hear the Word of God that you're ready to give generously back to God out of what he's lavishly provided that you're ready to encourage one another in your time together today let's go to a time of prayer before we um, give back to God and we worship him with prayer and communion. So let's pray. God, we approach you humbly, recognizing that you are the king of kings. You're the most high God. And we are totally unworthy to approach your throne. Yet you, you've adopted us as sons and daughters. You've called us friends. You became the perfect sacrifice and a permanent high priest so that we could boldly draw near to your throne with prayers of ad- adoration and our requests and our burdens, knowing that you delight in our prayers. And God, we ask you to help us to worship you as we should this morning, that you would purge us from the selfishness and the distractions that are so natural to our hearts and our minds. We pray that you would amaze us with your splendor, that you would convict us to the core with the sharp sword of your word, And that we would go out from this place today rejoicing, encouraged, because we've been with your people and under your word. Help us to give you our best this morning because you're our highest joy and our most precious possession. Lord, we pray that you would grow us as a church body. The countryside would not be a church that's conformed to this world or, or lulled to sleep by the comforts that this world has to offer, but that we'd be transformed by the renewing of our minds and strengthened, strengthened to bear up under the reproach and the scorn of a world who hates us because because they first hated you. God, help us to look on that world with love, knowing that while we were still sinners, you loved us and you died to make us your own. 
Lord, please strengthen and help the churches that we are in ministry with, pastors J.D. and Stephen as they pastor in Redemption Hill in Lawrence. Lord, please give discernment and boldness to Pastor Brian Warren in Mexico and, and the native pastors that he works alongside, pastors Joel and Javier and Daniel and Roberto. God, we pray that you would heal and sustain Pastor Roger Johansson as he, as he labors in Brazil for the sake of the gospel, that you would allow him to be faithful even through the physical difficulties he's experiencing. Please be with his wife, Crystal, as she grieves the loss of her uncle. Lord, continue to use the native Brazilian pastors that you've raised up and that you continue to mature. Pastor Jackson and Pastor João Judeus and Pastor Lucas and Libanus and Gersom and Edioma and Marcus. Lord, we, we pray that the gospel would go forth to all nations so that many will rejoice when you return to rule forever. So it's in the wonderful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning we're going to take communion together. So if you didn't grab a communion cup on your way in, you can make your way now to those back tables and feel free to grab a communion cup. And each week we ask you to approach this time seriously. If you're a believer in Christ, whether you belong to this church or another church, we ask that you would join us in taking the elements. And, and if you've not placed your trust in Jesus Christ, or if you're under church discipline at this church or another church, or if you have unrepentant sin in your life, then we would ask that, that you don't eat the bread and take the juice, but spend this time differently. Use it to look around at the people who are eating and drinking. Use it to consider your relationship to God and to be reconciled through sincere faith in Him alone. In just a moment, we're going to take some time, a couple of minutes in personal prayer. And, and this is a time of undistracted quietness in our hearts, a time for each of us to ask God to show us our sin and to acknowledge that sin and confess it before Him as we prepare our hearts together to rejoice in what he's done for us on the cross. So let's do that now. You can go ahead and open up your packet and take out the bread from your communion cup. And this morning, as we prepare for communion, I'd ask you to consider something with me. Consider the patience of God in providing redemption for us. I don't know about you, but my patience is always challenged during this time of year because I have gifts that I've purchased for the people I love and it kills me to wait to give them to them. And it's especially true with my wife and kids. I know them so well. I know their needs and I know their desires and I've spent time thinking about what would meet their needs and what would make them glad what would be meaningful to them. And once I have it, it kills me to not give it to them. So I give it and then I get something else. No. <laughs> but you know what? The patience that that requires of me is nothing compared to the divine forbearance and patience of God in sending the greatest gift of love ever provided, His Son, Jesus Christ. Listen to Galatians 4, 4 through 5. It says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. You see, God, He created the world and everything in it knowing what would take place. In fact, he planned what would take place. 
And before the foundation of the world, he predestined unworthy sinners like you and like me to receive a gift of measureless blessing, a gift of eternal impact, life and satisfaction in him. And that gift that we can't earn and that we don't deserve, it came at a great price. The life of his only begotten son. Think about this. As soon as Adam and Eve broke his law in the garden, and as soon as death and corruption and the terrible effects of human rebellion began, God had already prepared the solution. He tells us that. He, he says, I have a plan, a seed that will come from Eve to crush the head of the serpent. But you know what? He waited. He waits. And the world becomes wicked and evil and twisted and depraved and debased. And then God selects an un unworthy man out of that world and he reiterates his promise to send a blessing from one of this man's descendants, a blessing that will reach to all the nations. And he waits. He waits generation after generation. Why? Because of his grace. He reveals himself slowly to his creatures. The creatures that he designed to reflect his own glory and to his, enjoy his relationship. People. And he waits generation after generation so that every generation can see his goodness and his faithfulness and his mercy and his justice and his righteousness and his wrath and his glorious love as he reiterates his promise again and again and again. And he waits because there's a proper time for this gift to come. And when the fullness of time had come, when God had worked out every detail of his plan perfectly, when the world had been made ready for this moment, God sent forth his son, a gift that would mean everything to a world of sinners who had seen the futility of trying to save themselves. They had been longing age after age for a deliverer. And God came. God himself came into the world he made, into a body of flesh and blood as the gift of salvation that he had had planned from the beginning. You see, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's what Romans 5 tells us. The right time, while we were still weak, while we were still sinners, he looked upon us with love, knowing our deepest need, knowing what would be our greatest joy, our greatest delight, our greatest satisfaction, knowing that it would change our lives forever. And it was to be forgiven from sin, freed from the curse, and to have life fully in him. Listen, the gift he gave us was himself. Think about this today as you drink the juice and as you eat the bread, which symbolizes the body and the blood of Jesus Christ that was given for us when the fullness of time had come. I'll ask one of our deacons, Jesse Maxwell, to pray for the bread. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you demonstrated such love in sending Jesus at the right time to die in our place, to die the death that we deserved. That is a gift to loose us from the shackles of sin and death that held us without hope. Thank you for the hope that you've given us through the tremendous cost of Jesus' broken body. Amen. Well, remembering Christ and his broken body, let's eat together. I'd like to ask another deacon, Ryan Lynch, to come and pray for the juice. 
Lord, thank you so much for the unbelievable gift of your blood on the cross. Lord, so that we could spend an eternity with you. Lord, we just praise you and thank you in your name. Amen. We're remembering the blood of our Savior, the King, spilled for us. Let's drink together. Please stand as we continue worshiping in song together. Child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleep, whom angels greet with anthems while shepherds watch our He in such mean estate where ox and lamb are feeding. Good Christian, fear for sinners, the silent word is your heart is ready to pay attention to Christ our King, the King of Kings in his word this morning. You may be seated. Well, this morning we return to our study in the book of Matthew. And several weeks ago, Pastor Michael preached about two different kinds of blindness. Jesus encountered some blind men in verses 27 through 34 of Matthew chapter 9. And because of their faith in the Lord, Jesus healed the physical blindness of these two men who were following him and begging for his mercy. But there was a second kind of blindness that we saw in that passage, a spiritual blindness that was exposed 
as the Pharisees refused to acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah of God. Instead, they blasphemed him by attributing his power to Satan. So today, we come to an amazing display of the heart of God here at the end of chapter 9. So if you haven't already, you can turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. And then once you're there, if you would please stand one more time as I read the text for this morning. It says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You may be seated. You know, if you look at the sermon title this morning, you should recognize that it's an odd title. The title is Shepherd King. It's actually a title that we use over and over again in our gospel presentation during Journey to Judea. You see, at at the King David scene, the fourth scene on the journey, David explains the promise that God had made to him. And he says, This coming king is not only my shepherd who meets all my needs, he is my Lord. I hope you come to know him as your shepherd king on this journey. But what does that mean? That God's redeemer, Jesus, was a shepherd king? Because those were opposite ends of the social spectrum. That title makes no sense. A shepherd was the lowest of the low, dirty and despised by society. A king was the pinnacle of glory dignified, revered by all. So what was a shepherd king? Well, that's what Matthew is going to show us in this passage. He's going to show us Jesus the Messiah to be the highest of authority and power, even as he humbly cares for the needy and the lowly. And he engages others in that ministry. So Matthew highlights three realities of Jesus' ministry that act as a beautiful summary of how he cares for people. In verse 35, we see that Jesus was comprehensive in his care among the people. And the reason I say his care was comprehensive is because he ministered to people in every place and he ministered to every part of the person. Verse 35 says, And Jesus went throughout all, all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. So do you hear how expansive that language is? All, every, every, a full, complete ministry that he has in that region. So first, notice that he ministered to people in every place. He went everywhere throughout the region of Galilee. And it's not like there were just a few thousand people scattered throughout the hillsides or collected in small villages that he was visiting. The ancient Jewish historian Josephus tells us that there were more than 200 cities and villages in Galilee and that there was roughly 3 million people living in that area where Jesus was ministering. So that would have made teaching and traveling and healing exhausting work as the crowds pressed upon him day by day by day. And the language Matthew uses here in verse 35 is almost identical to what we heard back in chapter 4, verse 23. The words are the same, except instead of saying he went throughout all Galilee, It says, he went through all the cities and villages. And I think Matthew deliberately changed those words to show that Jesus didn't go just to the significant and populous places during his ministry. 
He did go to those places. He went to the cities that were larger and had a lot of people, but he also went to the villages that were just small settlements of people. He went into the central places of worship, and he walked the hillsides and the byways. And he went to all of those places because there were people there. There were people with needs that he wanted to meet. You see, if Jesus had been focused on his personal fame or establishing his political kingdom in a typical way, then he would have stuck to those heavily populated cities. He would have targeted people of influence, the places where the movers and shakers were making things happen. But he was not on a campaign tour. It was a ministry, a ministry to go out among the lost and the needy, the broken everywhere. So everywhere he could find them, he came to provide help that only the Messiah King could provide. And by the way, He did it personally. He touched them. He got to know them intimately. He cared for them as God in human flesh. But he didn't just minister to people in every place. He also ministered to every part of the person. Look at what he says he was doing. He was teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. So there's three actions there, teaching, proclaiming, and healing. And these three actions addressed every need that the people had. You see, in teaching them, he instructed their minds and their hearts so that they could understand what the scriptures were saying. In proclaiming, he heralded the coming of the kingdom, providing hope and assurance that God was bringing the fulfillment of his promises. And in healing them, he dealt with their diseases, their afflictions. He made them leave. He provided relief from their physical bodies and and freedom from demonic oppression and forgiveness for their sins. Look, this is the epitome of whole person care. And Christ was the only physician throughout all history that can boast perfect, holistic care. If you remember, Jesus has just described himself as a physician back in verse 12 of chapter 9. A physician that came here not to help those who were well, but to heal the sick. And so he was addressing every issue that the people had. If they, see, see, he knew that they had a problem with their understanding. And so he taught them. He went into the synagogues And he would explain the Old Testament to them. He would explain the promises of God and the meaning of God's prophecies. And you might think, why would they let him just waltz in and do that? Well, the reason is that they had a custom within the synagogues that if there was any distinguished guest that was visiting, that was a rabbi or a teacher that was well-known, that they could come and give the exposition of Scripture that day. So Jesus capitalized on that custom over and over throughout his ministry. Since they had specific texts that were read on a liturgical calendar, the sermon was essentially an explanation and an application of the Old Testament passages that were assigned for that day. So Jesus had been traveling around, astounding the crowds, that were following him, and the religious leaders. So whenever he visited a synagogue, he would be called to read and explain the day's text. Think think about that. God himself was preaching his word to his people, explaining the mysteries and intricacies of his own plan, wherein he was the fulfillment. Amazing. It reminds me of the first verses of the book of Hebrews, which say, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. 
Can you imagine? His ministry was a ministry of teaching them the word of God. But he also addressed their hopelessness as a people. That was another need. A people that despaired for their future and could see no opportunity for deliverance from oppression unless God's Messiah would appear. Unless God would intervene. And so Christ proclaimed that a kingdom, the kingdom of God was at hand. And that the the solution for the people was not merely a political kingdom. Not merely political deliverance but restoration to God through repentance from sin. We saw that back in chapter 4. Just after Jesus had been driven out into the wilderness to be tempted, he begins his public ministry. And in verse 17 of chapter 4, it says, From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see, he understood the reign of God on earth was coming. A time of just judgment upon sin and a time of great salvation and eternal blessing for those that were found clinging to God's Redeemer. So Jesus' message of proclamation was urgent. Turn away from your sin. Seek reconciliation with God and live faithfully to Him. Why? So that you're ready so that you're ready to receive the amazing blessings of his kingdom, which is soon to be established. His ministry was a ministry of preaching the kingdom, preaching repentance. But he didn't just teach and preach. He didn't overlook the harsh effects of sin and the curse of the world and the pain of his people. He recognized that the people had no ability to heal themselves, no doctor that could fix what was broken, so he healed them. These were the ones mangled, disgusting to look at, the ones that were isolated from society and rejected because they were thought to be judged and cursed by God. And you know what he did? He touched them. He spoke tenderly to them. He restored them as if they were a new creation. Because after they met with him, they were. He healed them. He came near to the ones that were desperately enslaved in their sin. Drew near to the ones oppressed by Satan. And he set them free. He removed their guilt from them as they looked to him by faith. And so he didn't just go to people in every place. But he cared for every part of the person. And you know what? Jesus' ministry here is the perfect answer to the blasphemous accusation that the Pharisees had leveled against him. Why? Because rather than giving a harsh rebuke to those who were trying to discredit him, he gives his attention to the people who desperately need him, who are desperately coming to him for help. And what he provides is something that Satan cannot provide. He shows his power as God to the desperate and dying. And he puts on display something that's going to become more and more evident in Matthew from this point on. Because as we continue in the book of Matthew, you're going to start to see this stark contrast between the attitude of these religious elites towards Jesus and the love of Jesus displayed for his people as he prepares to die for them. Up to this point, nothing's gotten too heated between Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees. There have been a few run-ins. In chapter 3, John called them a brood of vipers, connecting them with the serpent in Genesis. Jesus had warned the people in the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5 and 6 that they were not to worship hypocritically like some of the religious elites did, and he gave several examples of that. But it was really the Pharisees in chapter 9 who began to show their weariness with Jesus and his ministry among the people. They're disgruntled in verse 11 of chapter 9. They're like, he eats with tax collectors and sinners. And by verse 34, they're outright accusing him, saying, his power could only come from Satan. And from here, their frustration reaches a fever pitch That leads to them to start plotting his death by chapter 12. 
And so as these religious leaders grow more and more spiteful for, toward Jesus, he focuses his attention all the more on the people he's come to serve because he's locked in on the salvation that his Father has sent him to provide. He's determined to bring this salvation by his own people's rejection of him and his brutal sacrifice for them. This summary of his ministry should astound us, not only because of the breadth of his ministry, but because of the depth of the, his ministry as God. Think about that. The mighty God over all things chose to take on human flesh and come into the world he made personally and humbly so that he could painstakingly reveal himself as the Messiah King that he had promised from the very beginning. So what we see here is that the loving compassion of Jesus gets deeper and deeper as the opposition gets harsher and harsher. Jesus was comprehensive in his care among the people. And that leads us to a second reality of Jesus' ministry in verse 36. We see that Jesus was attentive in his compassion for the crowds. Notice that verse 36 says, When he saw the crowds. This means that he gazed intently out at the people. He saw them. I think you and I know what it means to be seen deeply, for someone to know you. He wasn't just peering out to see how many people in the crowds came to hear him speak. He wasn't scanning the crowds to see who the influential leaders were that came to see him. And he wasn't so puffed up with pride that he was concerned about nothing but himself and cared nothing for the people before him. No, with all of his attention focused on the people before him, he perceived their condition and he noticed their issues. And he saw their troubles, and he considered their state, and it impacted him to his core. Because he looked on these people, and as he looked on them with compassion, his body wrenched in pain. Verse 36 says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. And those words, he had compassion, those are translated from just one Greek word that means to be moved in the inward parts. You've probably felt that feeling many times before. You're, you're so emotionally rocked that your stomach begins to cramp and you feel sick. Maybe you just found out shocking news about someone you love that's just died. Or maybe you just got news of, an, of a devastating illness that's going to impact you or your child or your spouse or maybe you drive by a horrific wreck or you hear about a heinous crime. And you get sick to your stomach, like a weight sinking in, into the middle of you, like somebody just kicked you in the gut. That's what's being described here with Jesus. He's sick to his stomach over what's happening to his people, the people of Israel. His compassion for the people has overwhelmed his heart, and the grief he felt in his spirit caused his body pain because God cares for his people and Jesus was God in human flesh. Imagine the full weight of the divine expression of God's perfect compassion weighing down on a frail human form as he wrenches with pain. Matthew is now saying explicitly what he's implied earlier in chapter 8, verse 17, you remember where Jesus has been casting out demons and healing the illnesses of all that are coming to him. And then he says in, in verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. See there, he's not saying that Jesus contracted those illnesses and diseases, but that he was suffering with those people. That as he looked upon them and as he cared for them, he felt their pain. In his compassion, he saw their hurt. And friends, 
God has deep mercy for the desperate and dying, for the hated and hurting. And Hebrews 2.17 explained that Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And so as Jesus looks at his people and he sees the magnitude of of their need. He was sick with compassionate love for them. I'm sure the disciples saw it crushing down on him. They were with Jesus every day. I'm sure they could see it on his face. And Jesus doesn't hold it in. He turns to his disciples and he shares with them two clear pictures. The first picture that comes into his mind is the picture of sheep, sheep without a shepherd. Looking back at verse 36, Matthew tells us that he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Notice that there are three descriptions of the sheep in this illustration. First, they were distressed. That's what's meant by the word harassed. It's a word that's used of of an animal that's been torn and mangled. The flesh hanging off of them because they've been attacked and flayed. Second, they were desperate. This is the word helpless, which also implies lying still from total exhaustion. It's a word that indicates something is on the edge of death. It doesn't have the will or the energy to move any longer. And third, they were deserted. There's no shepherd to be found because as God looks out, over his people. He sees that they have no shepherd. The ones who should be shepherding them have failed. They failed to guide them. They failed to protect them. They failed to notice their need and to tend to their need. The image in Jesus' mind is very descriptive. And it's an illustration that God has used throughout the Old Testament. So Jesus knows it will be relatable to his disciples, and it will also connect with the prophecies that God has made throughout time. You see, the relationship of the sheep and a shepherd is a unique one because of how dependent sheep are as a creature. You see, most animals have instincts that God has given them to protect themselves and help them to survive. But sheep are remarkably helpless to survive for themselves, to provide for themselves, to guide themselves, to defend themselves. And it's not that they don't have any defense mechanisms or that they don't have any intellect. But without a good shepherd, their weakness and their susceptibility mean that almost anything can kill them. As I was studying this passage, I talked to my grandfather who kept sheep many years ago. And he he helped me to understand this illustration better, which would have been so clear to the disciples, but maybe not as clear to me or to you. He explained that of all of the herds of livestock that he had worked with, sheep were by far the most difficult because you couldn't leave them alone for one moment. Because if they got themselves in a bad situation, they had no sense for how to get out of it. For example, my grandpa said that if a sheep lies down and they're on uneven ground or next to a ditch and they get turned in a way that they go to get up and they can't stand, they will just lie there and lie there and lie there until they die. If it's bad weather and they're not led into shelter by either a sheep or the voice of a shepherd that they know, they'll just remain in the harsh conditions to their detriment. He said if you put out cool, clean drinking water beside them and there's a pond with dirty, stagnant water, They won't differentiate between the water sources. They may go and drink out of the polluted water rather than the water that you want them to drink and become sick. And he said, in keeping sheep, the saying is, sick sheep seldom survive. Once they're sick, they're as good as dead. Other shepherds have said that sheep are so scared of moving water that they will die of thirst before they will wade into a rushing stream to take a drink. 
because they're worried about being knocked off balance. So these are just the responses to natural elements and their basic needs. If they get caught in a fence, they'll just continue to try to push through the fence, thinking that that's the only way to free them, rather than head turn back up. They'll stay there until they die without help. My grandfather also explained that sheep are very hard to drive. You can't push them effectively. Not only do they become stressed out and anxious, but they scatter and they just don't go where you want them to go. And I know some of our J2J wranglers have experienced this. If, however, you get one or two sheep to follow a shepherd or a lead sheep, they'll follow wherever. They just have to be led. Sheep are driven, not led. And in fact, they're easily misled to their death. And almost everything is a predator for a sheep. All of the normal predators that you can think of eat sheep. But even foxes and birds of prey can kill sheep. Because sheep have no fight instinct and no defense mechanisms. They run and they huddle. That's it. No claws, no sharp teeth. They're not super speedy. So this is why many people that keep sheep today keep dogs with their sheep. Or even donkeys or llamas. Because having another animal with protection instincts is how the sheep are going to survive without their shepherd. They're in danger constantly without the shepherd close by. So... This helps us understand in context passages like Psalm 23, doesn't it? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He meets the basic needs I have for life. Clean, still water that I would never find on my own. Luscious grass that's good for nourishing me and where I can lay down in safety and get back up. He leads me there. He leads me. He doesn't drive me. Verse 4 says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You see, those are the tools of a shepherd. One for defending and one for guiding. Two sticks. The rod was a thick weapon, a club to beat off predators when they come to take one of the sheep. That's what David is talking about when he references killing the bear and the lion who came after his father's sheep using the rod. The staff, though, was a long stick with a crook at the end. It's it's iconic to what we think of with shepherds because a stuck sheep or a wandering sheep needs to be guided back to the safety of the flock under the care of the shepherd. And the crook allowed them to loop the long staff around the neck and chest of the sheep and pull them back to safety, pull them out of the ravine, out of the water, away from the predator, back to himself. And there were plenty of religious leaders claiming to guide the people and claiming to be God's servants to lead the people. But as Jesus looks out at the crowds, he doesn't see a well-tended flock. He sees the people harassed and helpless, fatigued and forlorn, dejected, despised, deserted, untended, unprotected, and unsought. In fact, the very men, the religious leaders who were supposed to be caring for these sheep were the ones gashing them with wounds of neglect and exhausting them with rules and hypocritical standards and devouring them for selfish, greedy gain. And Jesus knows this all too well because God has already spoken of this long ago through his prophets. The the words of Ezekiel are ringing in his ears. Ezekiel 34, verses 3 through 5 says, You eat the fat. You clothe yourselves with wool. You slaughter the fat ones. But you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed. The injured you have not bound up. The strayed you have not brought back. The lost you have not sought. And with force and harshness you have ruled them. God goes on in that 
chapter to talk about how he will deal with the wicked shepherds, but he promises that he himself will come to shepherd his people. In verse 15, we read, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. And verse 23 says, I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. That's talking about the Messiah, David's seed. He shall be the prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. Jeremiah, the prophet, in chapter 23, uses the same illustration and connects it to the Messiah of God. Micah, chapter 5, says Christ will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. The prophet Zechariah was actually called to become a shepherd as part of a, a living illustration for this very thing. God called him to go before the people of Israel and shepherd a flock doomed for slaughter, tending to the sheep of a flock that was afflicted. And in chapter 11, at the end of Zechariah's time tending this flock, do you know what he was given for his wages? 30 shekels of silver. The same price that would one day be paid for the life of the good shepherd who was sent by God to care for the flock doomed to slaughter. And while these people were not being cared for by their scribes or their priests or their elders, God had sent the good shepherd to care for them. In John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You know, it would have been so easy for Jesus to be worn out and frustrated with doing healing after healing, sign after sign, teaching after teaching after teaching to an endless stream of people, most of whom still didn't see him as the king. But you know what? He isn't. He isn't irritated. He isn't burnt out because he loved these people. And as their God, he had watched them be torn and exhausted by evil, selfish shepherds. And now he had come into the world to give them rest and to give them hope. You see, Jesus was comprehensive in his care among the people. And Jesus was attentive in his compassion for the crowds. And that leads us to a third reality. Jesus was urgent in his commission to the disciples. Verse 37 says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, earnestly pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So as Jesus looks out at the people and is moved with compassion, he knows that there are many, many needs to be met. And it's not as if Jesus doesn't have the capacity or the power to meet their needs. But he knows that the time is short before he will go to die for these sheep. And he knows that it is God's will that faithful disciples labor alongside him in the ministry and the proclamation of the kingdom. So here Jesus commissions his disciples to engage the need with him. And he points out the need and the problem and the hope or the solution. First, he explains the need. And the need is the ready harvest. So Jesus is switching his illustration here. He's going from sheep and their shepherd to a master with his fruitful fields. And he presents the need from the view, viewpoint of a landowner who has fields of mature crops that need to be harvested and brought in before they're ruined. If you know any farmers, then you know that the, the window for harvest can be really tight, especially if they have a lot of ground to cover. And, and during harvest, that farmer works long, hard days, if he can, sometimes through the night, sometimes hiring other laborers to come and help him get the crops out of the field. Because if the crops 
are not harvested in time, some crops will rot, or they'll become overripe, or they'll be diseased or spoiled. And referring to the crowds in Galilee, he says to his disciples, there is a great need here. The harvest is ripe, it's ready, and the time is now. And that leads to his assessment of the problem. See, the problem is the sparse labor. The problem is the sparse labor. See, even though the crops were ready, there were not enough laborers to do the work. There was no GPS-guided combine with a grain truck behind it. This was painstaking manual labor that he was referring to. Personal. Personal, intentional labor. The scope of the harvest is much bigger than what a few workers could accomplish. In the next chapter, we're going to see Jesus commission and empower his disciples to go out into the harvest, ministering to the Jewish people and proclaiming the kingdom of God. But Jesus was thinking about even more laborers than just he and his 12 disciples. And we know that because the first action that he commissions his disciples to do is what? To pray. He commissions them to pray for more laborers. The first action his compassion motivates is an urgent instruction for his disciples to call out to the Lord of the harvest. And that's what leads us to the hope. The hope is the sovereign master. Look back at verse 38. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Do you see the humility and dependence there? Jesus wanted his disciples to express the same kind of humility that he expressed as he submitted himself obediently to his Father's will and his Father's plan. He wanted them to acknowledge that the harvest belonged to the sovereign master, the Lord of the harvest, and that the only hope for these harassed and helpless people was for more God-sent workers to go out and spread the message of repentance to a people that were ready to hear it. A people ready to experience the healing for their souls and the relief of their afflictions as God fulfilled his promises of ages past. You see, these two verses are often used for missionaries or for churches that are wanting to see the gospel go out to all the nations, spread throughout all the earth. But we need to realize what's going on here. Because Jesus is not talking about sending Christ followers into all the world to make disciples for God. Not here. And we know that because in chapter 10, when he sends out the disciples, he specifically tells them not to focus on on the people of the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but to go out to the Jews in Galilee, the flock of God. So what's going on? Well, Jesus, knowing the Old Testament prophecies, knows that these are the lost sheep of Israel, this nation of his sisters and brothers, and that they're going to experience judgment on the day of the harvest. And he knows there isn't much time. And in God's timing and God's plan, Jesus was a Jew sent to minister to the Jewish people, sent to call them to repentance and to restore them to fellowship with God before the great judgment of God and the eternal kingdom of God was established. When the harvest is taken up, all those who have embraced the Messiah of God by faith and turned away from their sin will be taken up into the master's barn. But all those who reject him will be burned up as fruitless weeds. That's what Jesus is going to explain in Matthew chapter 13, that the harvest is coming. And the reality is that for all these hurting, broken people, if they don't hear and respond to the gospel being proclaimed by their own Messiah, they will perish. Jesus knows that soon his own people will reject him and will crucify him. And then will follow a great period of blindness for his people. The goodness that he is now offering them 
would become a stumbling block to them as they rejected him as their Messiah, looking for another Messiah to come. But don't, don't sit there and think that Jesus doesn't care about the rest of the world or about us as Gentiles. He does. In fact, in Matthew chapter 15, a Canaanite woman who, who had a daughter that was possessed by a demon came out wailing and begging for Jesus to help her. And Jesus, he explained to her his, his mission in verse 24. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she expresses to him her humble faith, and he delivers her daughter. He shows her grace and mercy because she approached him in faith. You see, he had a mission assigned by God, but he also freely gave deliverance to all who came to him by faith. And he knew that God had a plan for the salvation of the Gentiles in all the world. And at the end of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 28, we will hear Jesus give another commission, one that's not limited to the Galilean Jews, but is extended to the whole world of Gentile nations, calling them to go and make disciples of Jesus Christ. So that's the nature of the harvest that Jesus is describing. Because he looks on this people with compassion, and he desires more to go out and care for them. And he desires the right quality of worker, a God-sent worker, a worker that God has driven out, thrust out into the harvest. He wants laborers called and empowered by God to faithfully preach to this lost nation that's deserted and headed for judgment if they don't receive their shepherd king before the arrival of his kingdom. He wants his disciples to see that his will is aligned with the Father. And he knows this. He knows that their fervent prayers to the Lord of the harvest will create in them the same burden that he has to go and preach to the, the kingdom, to help in healing through the power that God will give them. Friends, a shepherd king is a unique king. A shepherd king is a compassionate guide that will defend and nourish his people that will care for them out of his powerful authority and his might, that will bring all things under subjection to him in glory. Jesus is the great shepherd, and Jesus is also the king of kings. He was comprehensive in his care among the people. He was attentive in his compassion for the crowds, and he was urgent in his commission to the disciples. So let me ask you, do you Know him as your shepherd king. Let's look at how this applies to our lives today. First, recognize the great power of King Jesus to bring salvation and healing. Do you know that Jesus didn't stop ministering to this broken world when he ascended back to heaven? His earthly ministry was fulfilled while he was here in human flesh, but he is still powerfully working in our world today. You see, his spirit that he sent after he ascended helps us. It fills and empowers believers to proclaim the gospel to the helpless and to the hopeless. He, he intercedes for Christians at the Father's side, helping us to pray as we ought and attentively listening to our concerns. He responds to our prayer with his healing power. He provides in amazing ways for the destitute and the dying. And you know what? He grants healing all the time that doctors can't explain. Most amazingly, though, he opens the eyes of a world of people who could not see the truth and the realities of his kingdom if the king himself did not reveal it to them. Second, remember the deep compassion of King Jesus when you're hurting. The same Jesus who saw the oppression and the needs and the illnesses and the hopelessness of Israel looks with loving compassion on you. You see, compassion finds its fullest expression in God. 
love finds its deepest reality in the person of God. There is no one who feels your pain more deeply than the one who made you in his image. The one who formed you according to his specific purpose and died on the cross because of your guilt in your unworthiness to provide salvation for you and himself. Sometimes we feel like no one understands our pain. And how could they? Because they haven't experienced the things that we've experienced. They haven't gone through what we've been through. But let me tell you something. God can relate to us in a deeper way than anyone else could ever imagine because he lowered himself from glory into a human body of flesh just like us. And he put on that flesh so that he could relate to each and every person in the fullness of what we experience to provide us rest and peace as we trust in him. That's the truth. The Messiah King, the Shepherd King, is a king of compassion. Finally, go to God with earnest prayer for the salvation of the lost. You see, we can realize that this passage is talking specifically about the lost sheep of Israel. But understanding these verses, we can also take away valuable principles that we see many other places in Scripture. Because we know some things. We know that God planned from the beginning to bring blessing to all the nations of the world through the family of Abraham and specifically through his promised Redeemer, Jesus Christ. We know that God desires that all people should be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And we know that it is only by God's grace and power that people come to saving faith. Therefore, we must pray earnestly for faithful messengers to go and proclaim the gospel so that sinners may be saved. Now you might say, okay, well what about our commission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Well, I'm saying that this is part of fulfilling that commission and that Jesus' example here shows us what God expects of us as the critical first step of our ministry. Why? Because it acknowledges the truth. When we pray to the Lord, it acknowledges that we can't fix this problem on our own. We can't save the world of people or meet their needs. Only He can. And it recognizes that the need in our world is not for more groups or people that are self-appointed, self-empowered, social justice warriors, but for Christ-called, gospel-filled heralds of the truth that are armed with the mighty power of the Holy Spirit and zealous for the kingdom of God. That's who God uses to spread his message. Listen, here's the truth. We get engaged in going with the gospel when we pray for God to send people with the gospel. If you have a friend that you care deeply about who's not saved, or you have a family member that you desperately want to see come to Christ, then you need to start praying and begging God for someone to tell them about the truth, that that God would open their eyes to come to know him as their shepherd king. And if you do that faithfully, day by day by day, And not just here or there, but every day, if you pray for God to send someone to that person, then something's going to happen. Your heart for that person to hear the gospel is going to grow and grow and grow with every prayer you pray. And the burden of you telling them the gospel with every opportunity that you're given is going to go, grow. And you're going to know that even if you're not the one that God uses to open their eyes to the truth, that God has called you to engage someone with the truth, and you're going to be ready to engage them. So it's not that we do nothing but pray, but we do nothing without prayer. Maybe you don't pray very often for others to come to know Christ, or for others to be sent out to preach the gospel, or for the Lord 
to raise up leaders who will faithfully declare his message. But think about why. Why don't you pray more often? Is it because most of your prayer is focused on things that you desire God to do for you? Is it because you haven't looked intently at the crowds of people around you and all of the desperate needs they have? Is it because you need to grow in your compassion for a world of doomed sinners and have the same perspective that your shepherd king has for you and for them? Is it because you forget that there is judgment soon coming and all those who have not turned away from their sin and unto Christ will perish eternally? Christian, pray earnestly. Develop a heart of compassion that doesn't look at, at the world around us as frustrating and foolish and as the enemy, but has a deep, desperate compassion for lost sinners that are in need of a shepherd king. Will you pray with me? God, this passage is so convicting for us as we see your heart for us, your heart for the world. And we consider what you came to do, what you had planned from the beginning of time to meet our needs, to heal our hurts, and to provide redemption we didn't deserve. Lord, we see you as a God of compassion. We pray that you would develop that compassion, that mercy and love in our hearts, that we would be those earnestly praying to you, depending upon you to reap a harvest of righteousness, souls who know their shepherd king. We pray this in your great power and your great name as our shepherd king. Amen. And, and we'll sing together. Love came down to earth and made his home with men. The hopeless found a home, the sinner found a friend. Not to the powerful, but to the poor he came. And humble, hungry hearts were satisfied again. What Joy, what peace has come to us? What hope, what help, what love? When every Was scourged upon his back and hammered through his feet. The innocent is cursed, the guilty are released. The punishment of God on God has brought me peace. What joy!
Let's close with the precious hope of Hebrews 13, 20 through 21, which says, Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, you're dismissed. If we could have a few people help us with the chairs on the north section, that would be great. Have a good week in the Lord.